between ontology, epistemology, and ethics, and can show how the very practice of compassion is conducive to true and deep understanding. Today's Bradley conference entitled Compassion and Understanding in Islam will surely help us to a better understanding the primacy for Muslims of divine compassion, Rahman. The lecturer, Dr. Arel Ali Najed, studied engineering, philosophy of science, and hermeneutics at the University of Iowa and the University of Delft. He also studied as a special student at the University of Toronto and the Pontifical Gregorian University. He is a former professor at the Pisais and the International Institute for Islamic Thought and Civilization in Malaysia. And he is currently an advisor to the Cambridge Integrated Program at the Faculty of Divinity in Cambridge. We are very thankful to Dr. Arif for his kindness in sharing today this fascinating and important topic with us. Thank you and now to you the word. <coughs> In the name of God, <coughs> merciful compassion, praise be to God, blessings upon the prophets of God, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khatim and Biyad al Your Eminence, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, peace and blessings be upon you all. Islamic theology, or kalam, must strive to be a proactive, ever fresh articulation of the compassionate and life giving teaching of Islam. Otherwise, Kalam, Islamic theology, risks being frozen into simple irrelevance despite its impressive evidence of past theological formulations. This imperative has been deeply felt and shared by several Muslim scholars since at least the 19th century. It is this imperative that grounds the works of such Sunni scholars as al jisr of Syria, Al-Farahi, Nu'mani, and later on Iqbal of India, Al-Madani, Al-Sayyadi, and then Al-Nursi, and Mustafa Sabri and Tawfari of Turkey, Muhammad Abdu, Ibn Ashur, and more recently, Faha Abdul Rahman. Abdul is from Egypt, Ibn Ashur is from Tunis, Faha Abdul Rahman from Morocco. It is also the imperative that grounds the works of such Shi'i scholars as Al Afghani, Qaba Qaba'i, Mutahari, and more recently, Shabastani, all of Iran, and Muhammad Bakr Sadr, and Abdul Jabbar bin Tahir of Iraq. This is the imperative of what has been called New Kalam. I maybe bore some of you with a long list of strange sounding names, but the point of this paragraph is to point out that this is by no means a new endeavor. There are other human beings who work very hard to try to make sure that Kalam is ever fresh and who are not content with just repeating the medieval formula without any development. Islamic theology must face such troubling issues as today's rampant cruelty of humans against humans, and the cruelty of humans against other creatures, and the very environment in which we all strive to live. It is this imperative that must motivate Muslims to work out well-grounded Islamic approaches to face the challenges that dawn today's troubled humanity. I have been striving to articulate such a fresh Islamic theology in a way that is continuous with my own North African I am Libyan uh, by birth. My North African Ash'arat, Maliki, Shadi, Rifa'i, Sunni tradition. And yet, 
open to the contributions of advances in such contemporary fields as hermeneutics, semiotics, pragmatics, and speech act theory. My progress has been frustratingly slow due to the massive terrain that one must cover in multiple disciplines and multiple religious and cultural spaces, but also due to the fact that for the past nine years or so, I have had to take care of an elaborate family enterprise in humble obedience to the command of my ailing father. In my struggle for a fresh theological articulation, I have for long been deeply aware of the immense importance of dialogical, and this is a term that I like to use, co-theologizing, in which one articulates and elaborates one's own theology in full view of and engagement with the theological efforts of other religious and philosophical communities. The idea is that the Muslim elaborates his theology, but mindful of the Jew and the Christian and the Buddhist and the Hindu, and the same for the others. The idea is not to mix up theologies or to make up a hybrid creature, but to actually do your own theology, being responsible to the other who is ever so present next to you as your neighbor and your friend. I am truly pleased to be back in Rome at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, where I did spend more than two intense years during the late 90s, keeping theologically and spiritually busy while learning and teaching in the midst of a deeply Christian environment with such great, great friends and colleagues as Father Zetian Renaud, Michel Lagarde, and Louis Lormans, and, Mich and Michael Fitzgerald. I am also pleased to have had a chance to visit this morning the Pontifical Gregorian University, where I have, during the late 80s and early 90s, eagerly attended some courses and where Father Dan, uh, Dan Madigan is now carrying out profound dialogical theological work with a group of impressively bright young scholars. My more, recent, my more recent experiences of working with Christian and Jewish scholars, such as David Ford, Peter Oakes, Ben Posh, and Oliver Davies, through the Scriptural Reasoning Endeavor and the Cambridge Interfaith Program at the Faculty of Divinity in Cambridge, have again and again reconfirmed the tremendous value of elaborating one's theology in full engagement with others. I have come to solemnly believe that dialogue is a condition of possibility of proper theolog theolog theologizing and not just a polite and nice afterthought to theologize. Meaning, we should not do theology and after we finish decide to have dialogue. We should have the dialogue while we elaborate our theologies. This is extremely important. Dialogue cannot be an afterthought it cannot be an instrumental thing that we use for uh, worthy endeavors according to what we believe, but it should be something that is part of our very effort to do theology and to live theology. However, dialogical theologizing can never be fruitful if it is not also deeply rooted in one's own tradition. I am truly grateful to my Muslim masters and teachers in Malaysia, then the United Arab Emirates and Libya, for having graced me with their companionship, chisofa, and wisdom. Only through the togetherness of love, which is called in Arabic, al-ma'iyya bil mahabba, is the essential connectivity with one's tradition maintained. It is not possible to get theology or to get theological wisdom through books only. One must be in line with the tradition and must try to have a kind of wirata of the tradition through sohba, which is companionship with the scholars, and proper sanat, or proper lineage of scholarship. I am glad that some Muslim friends who are equally committed to the vision of a deeply rooted yet open-ended Islamic theology have graced me with their presence today. I am excited that the Muslim Foundation with such a vision has been established in Abu Dhabi under the name of Taba Foundation by Sidi Ali Jifri, who continues the great ulama tradition of Yemen, and his colleagues such as Sidi Jihad Brown, who continue the great ulama tradition of Syria. And they are represented here today. I am so glad that the Christian Foundation, such as the Bradley Foundation, has generously supported uh, an event such as this. This is quite significant and quite graceful that they support Muslim Christian understanding. Allah in the Quran provides us with a wonderful parable, or method in Arabic, of what all proper theological discourse should be like. I interpret in English. This is from the Quran. Do you not see how Allah sets forth a parable 
a wholesome word is like a wholesome tree whose root is firm and whose branches reach into the heaven. It provides its fruit at all times by the leave of its Lord. Allah sets forth parables for mankind in order that they may remember. Thus, according to the Quran, all proper and wholesome theological discourse must be a wholesome word. And the criteria listed or indicated in the Quran are number one, rootedness, must be rooted. Secondly, open-endedness, must be open-ended and, and open to, to further elaboration and articulation. And thirdly, very important, it must not be sterile, must be ever fresh and fruitful, so that it must have benefits for humanity. Otherwise, it's not good theological discourse and not good theology. I believe that Islamic theology today must strive to abide by these divine criteria, must be rooted, open-ended, and ever fresh and fruitful. It must be firmly rooted in the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Ijma' of the Ummah. It must be open-ended through the dialectical and respectful dialogue with other theologies and even philosophies. It must be constantly refreshed and focused on bearing fruits that can serve the Ummah and humanity at large. Theological rootedness must start with focus on Allah Himself and the very remembrance of Him, exalted be. However, this cannot be done directly, for the Divine Essence is beyond all approaches, as Imam Ghazali points out. Allah must be approached through the contemplation of His operative signs, or ayat, and through the remembering and proclamation of His names, as He Himself has taught them to us through Divine Revelation. We can only speak of God the way God has told us to speak of God. This is a very Islamic position, it's also very Barbie. <laughs> Allah must be approached through contemplation of his operative signs and through the remembering and proclamation of his names as he himself has taught them to us through divine revelation. However, there are many ways of, of approaching divine signs. And there are many ways and names through which Allah teaches to approach him. Each one of us must, in a sense, articulate his, his own approach to the signs of ayat. I shall call such an effort an ayatology, okay. <laughs> which is a, this is definitely a hybrid. Okay. <laughs> Half of it is our way, ayat, which means sign or operative sign, the other is the logos, of course. Okay. Each one of us must also approach through the divine names a uh, name or names he or she finds most relevant and urgently needed in the situation and conditions of the time. I focus on the divine names Ar Rahman and the related Ar Rahim and call this doctrine Rahmatology. <laughs> <laughs> Being in Rome, I feel quite courageous about these origins. You know, you have these people also. This is something I picked up from the Gregorian. <laughs> You know, there is this uh, Turkish scholar, his name is Saeed al Nursi, who says that when he was asked, What is the Ismul Ara? What is the great name of God? Because there are mystical things about the great name of God. And he said, The great name of God is that particular divine name that brings you to God. So for each person, it would be different depending on the situations, even within one's own lifetime. The 99 names of God that are taught to us by, by Allah and His Prophet Muhammad. Are, are ways to him, and there are many ways of approaching the Lord. I believe that by focusing on Ar Rahman and the Rahim, these are names that are related to compassion, that a, an interesting highlighting of features within Muslim theology can emerge. We must remember Allah as Ar Rahman. Islam is a continuous prayer of remembrance. The Arabic word I have in mind when I say remembrance is dhikr. Dhikr, which comes from the root dhakara, means both remembering, mentioning, and even proclaiming. Now one remembers by always mentioning and proclaiming. And one mentions and proclaims because he or she remembers. To live Islam is to live a continuous activity of remembering and mentioning. It is a known psychological technique if you want to remember something that you should keep repeating it until you find the pen and paper. 
<laughs> so the idea is, if you really want to remember Allah Azza wa Jal, you have to continuously do dhikr, yeah. remembrance, by uttering His divine names. But why all this talk of remembering and mentioning? <laughs> who are we supposed to remember and who are we supposed to mention? The answer is simple, Allah. It is Allah, our one and unique God, and the Lord that we must always remember and mention. But why do we have to actively remember and mention Allah? Isn't He not the most real and manifest? As Ibn Abba'Allah secondary says in the Hikab, كَيْفَ يُسْتَدَلُّ عَلَيْهِ وَهُوَ ظَاهِرُ فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ How can I have an evidence for His existence when He's so manifest in everything? So it's a valid question. How can we possibly remember Allah since He's so there, real? Isn't He not the most real and manifest? How can that which is most real and manifest be in need of remembrance? The answer is this. Our need to remember and mention Allah does not arise from a lack of manifestation on His part, but from a nasty propensity to forget on our part. <laughs> Allah has created an abundance of creatures. To them all He is real and manifest. They all remember Him and sing His praises at all times. Unfortunately, there is only one exception to this observation. Humankind. For humans are the only creatures that are capable of forgetting God. The stones remember God and sing His praises, for example, by following the patterns of being that He endowed them with. The birds, the clouds, the sun, the winds, all do the same. They never forget Allah, but we humans forget Him. But how can this be? Aren't we supposed to be the most special of Allah's creatures? How can the stones and the birds be better than us? Well, the stones and the birds do not have to be better than us. We can just as continuously remember and mention Him, <coughs> if we are sufficiently vigilant and diligent. Furthermore, when we do remember and mention our Lord, we are indeed better than the stones and the birds, because we do so intentionally, while they do so automatically. Now we begin to see that our capacity to forget, our very forgetfulness, our propensity towards amnesia, if you like, is a gift from Allah. Why? Because it is the condition of possibility of our intentional, deliberate, and free remembering and mentioning of Him. But why should we remember and mention Allah? The answer is this. We should remember Him and mention Him in order to express our deep gratitude for His compassion or Rahmah towards us. Thus we come to Allah's compassion or Rahmah. Unless we continuously remind ourselves and others of Allah's compassion, we would fail in our prayers to Him, in our duty to live righteously before Him. The great sages of the Islamic spirituality have passed down through continuous chains of transmission that link us with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself. Various simple formulae of remembrance. No formula is more powerful in reminding us of the compassion of Allah and the call to practice compassion than the formula Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, merciful and compassion. This powerful, operative, and efficacious formula is demanded of a Muslim in all his or her daily acts. As one gets up, starts walking, starts eating, starts drinking, in short, starts living, he or she is to offer this daily reminder of Allah's compassion and demands it, uh, and the demands it makes on us. So if I want to drink, take a sip of water because I'm thirsty, say Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim and then I drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, through that very act, basically through the invocation of the name of, of God, the act of drinking becomes an act of worship. And if you do that with every single act in your life, your life becomes sanctified through this invocation of the name of God. Much of classical kalam or Islamic theology is rightly focused on the Islamic legal formula, which is La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. As the great theologian Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Sunusi says in his popular manual, which is called Umul Barahin, this is a standard aqidah that was taught throughout uh, North Africa and Africa at least. And in this manual he says that all Muslim theology can be summed up in the creed of La ilaha illallah. 
no God but the one God. And actually, if you look at the manuals of Muslim theology, that's what they try to accomplish. Well, I would like to make a prolegomena or a set of prolegomena to the, to the theological work on La ilaha illallah by focusing on the Basmala, which is Bismillah rahman rahim I believe that Bismillah rahman rahim a theology of that, okay, of the invocation of the divine name of Ar-Rahman and the divine name of Ar-Rahim, the compassionate, is a precondition and the uh, and condition of possibility for a proper theology today. I can only get to the theology of explicating La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the traditional way of doing it, by prefacing all of that with a theology of compassion. And mind you, you know, when you put something in the front, it does affect the totality. Prefaces are very important, not only in, in divine matters, but even in mundane philosophical matters. Some people say, for example, the preface to the phenomenology of spirit of Hegel, for example, is more important than the phenomenology of spirit of Hegel. So, I, I truly believe that it is very important what we choose to enter upon theology. And I believe that the invocation of compassion prior to theological systematic work is extremely important. While very much respecting all the manuals centered around the creedal formula, I truly believe that something very important can be learned and gained by refocusing Islamic theology, so, so that the creedal formula is approached through theological prolegomena that center around the invocation of the compassion-related names of, of Allah. In the name of Allah, merciful compassion. Bismillah rahman rahim Such a prolegomena is what I mean by rahmatology. Allah God has many sublime names. The tradition of Islam teaches 99 names that are commonly invoked in prayers and meditations. Of course, Allah has many more names than just the 99, as is pointed out in the Maqsad al-Asna of Imam al-Ghazali and in the Shajarat al-Ma'arif of Izzuddin ibn Abdi Salam. Approaching Allah through any particular name or set of names tends to flavor one's theology. Particular names stress particular divine attributes or characterizations or sifat. Theologies are often pedagogically expressed as preaching approaches and tend to shape the character, i.e. to characterize the devout community. So it's not an, an unimportant issue what theology you begin with, because it is the theology that will ground your preaching and what, what, what the khatib would say in the Jum'ah prayers. And, and uh, it, it's very important that a wholesome compassion uh, invoking preaching be developed Okay, and encouraged based on a compassion-centered theology. Thus, the stress on a particular name or set of names tends to shape the character of a community through the operative efficacy of that name or set of names. For various historical and apologetic reasons, Sunni Muslim theologies, be they of Ash'ari or Maturidi schools, have tended to stress divine names that, associate, that are associated with knowledge, will, and life, and ilm, Irada and Hayat. As a matter of fact, Imam Ghazali, even though he devotes a very nice section to the name Ar-Rahman and the name Ar-Rahim in his important book Al-Maqsad Al-Asna, then says that they are subsumed under will or Irada. While he is the Shaykh of our Shaykh and the master of, of, our, of my masters, uh, I, I beg to differ. I believe that it is not Rahma and Rahman uh, is not reducible to Irada. And I believe that that's very crucial. If you reduce compassion to irada, you end up with a will-centered theology. If you uh, stress rahma, you end up with a rahma-centered theology, a compassion-centered theology. And what I want to do is basically to respectfully change the priorities by stressing that the Rahman and Rahim must be the starting point of Muslim theology. And I, I have a lot of support on, on, on my side, from the Quran and the Sunnah, and from Ghazali himself, in some other ways. <laughs> okay. And also from Shaykh al ibn Abdul Salam, who is also a Shaykh of our Shaykh, a master of, of my masters. Rahmatullahi <laughs> alayhi, may God bless their souls. The grand edifice, <clears throat> the grand edifice of intricate theological work of the two classical schools has become the grounding presuppositions of much of preaching in Muslim communities. So if you have a will-based theology, you will have a will-based preaching. 
and I believe that we desperately need compassion-based preaching. Therefore, we must develop compassion-based theologies. And when I say develop, I don't mean invent. I am not one of those so-called mujaddids who try to invent a new Muslim theology. I very much like to be in continuation with the traditions, and I believe that this is in the tradition. We just need to highlight it. As the German philosopher and heaven with Hans Georg Gadamer says, all interpretation is highlighted. And when you were studying in university, maybe you noticed when you highlight something, you can never read the other stuff. You know, when you, when you try, you know, once you've highlighted the book in preparation for the exam, you try to read it again, and you always ignore the other stuff. As if, you know, so all highlighting is by definition a kind of treason to the whole. So I know by stressing this that maybe I am neglecting some other things. But this is the human condition. And we need to highlight what we need in our own time. And I believe in this cruel world, this is what we need. Of course, the theologians never had a monopoly on the deeper grounding of Islamic preaching. Spiritual teachers and popular sentimental preachers have always been closer to devout communities and, ha and have had the most influence on the characterization of communities. However, many works by spiritual teachers tend to start <coughs> with canonical theological statements that are basically summaries of the great theological manuals of the Ash'arites and the Maturidis. What I mean to say here is the following. Um, there is this wrong idea that Sufis, for example, are, are necessarily unorthodox. There, there are unorthodox Sufis, of course. Okay? <laughs> However, the majority of Sufis are orthodox, and most of them would preface their spiritual writings with proper theological prefaces to stress the doctrinal rectitude of their ways. So, for example, in the Risal al Bushayriya, which is a fundamental manual of the soul, the Aqidah al Ash'ariya is very clean in the beginning. The, the creed is stressed. Also, in the famous Ibn Arabi, whom some people would like to adopt as a sort of a non orthodox theologian, he himself says in the beginning of the Futuhat, This is my Aqidah, you know, this is my creed, and he puts the Aqidah al Ash'ariya. Also, in his Wasiyah, uh, at the end of his life, he is stressing the Aqidah Ash'ariya. So the notion that the soul is somehow unorthodox or necessarily unorthodox is something which is sometimes uh, unfairly said again and again. And very interestingly, there is a kind of consensus about that point between some Western scholars and Wahhabis, uh, because they, these uh, also think that the soul is unorthodox. So what I'm trying to say is, we must be very careful to understand that even these preachers who talk popularly about things like compassion did stress the Aqidah Ash'ariya. Even Sidi Ahmad Rifai, whom I will be speaking about at the end of the, uh, of the uh, paper, inshallah, uh, he also stresses the Aqidah Ash'ariya. So there is no contradiction. Uh, as Sidi Ahmad Zarruq, uh, late 16th century uh, North African Sufi says, in order to have proper theology, that is uh, complete in its dimensions. One must cover creed, which is Iman, through work of theology. One must cover jurisprudence, or fiqh, through works of, of fiqh um, and, and, uh, and law. And one must also cover spirituality, or ihsan, through works of the soul. So in this formula, there is a three dimensions to the teaching. Proper creed, proper jurisprudence, but also proper spirituality. As the Matan ibn Ashar, which is a fundamental book uh, for, uh, for Malikis, uh, he says, في عقد الأشعري وفق مالك وفي طريقة الجنيد السالك Meaning, the, the creed is Ash'ari, jurisprudence is Malikite, and the طريقة is that of Junaid, of Baghdad. The Hanafi is like another formula. They have the Maturidi for Aqidah, Hanafi for jurisprudence, and usually Naqshbandi or Mawlawi for the Tariq. The fact that spiritual teachings were often richer and more abundant than the, than the extensive but still limited scope of the manuals of theologies has often left spiritual preaching without clearly articulated roots in systematic <coughs> theological doctrines. The very praxis of particular spiritual masters was characterized and characterized followers by particular divine names without much systematic theological articulation. Perhaps the intensive dynamics 
and the to and fro of rich spiritual lives could not really be fit into the confines of systematic theological statements. It is said of the famous Abu Hassan al-Shadili, the founder of the Shadiliya order, when he was asked, how come you have no books? He said, kutubi ashabi, my books are my friends, meaning the very character of his ashab or companions has become his books the, through the suhbah, as the Shadiliya also say, a suhbah sabbah, meaning companionship can color you. Okay? So, it is possible that a, a preaching of compassion is taught just through the practice of compassion. Okay? However, it does help to have an articulated theology of compassion to ground it, because sometimes people think that if you don't have a systematic theology behind the preaching, that somehow you're too fuzzy about me. Okay? Very North, Afri uh, North uh, not African American. <laughs> As in the famous fuzzy was he was a baby. <laughs> Several spiritual masters or Sufis, most notably Ibn Arabi and his ramified school, did develop very complex theologies of names. However, and this is the most and this is most unfortunate, these theologies were not reflected back into the systematic manuals of theology. So it's very interesting that while there is this tremendous theology of names in the Futuhat, they don't quite enter into the aqidah that's in the beginning. Okay? because they don't want that to touch it. I don't want to touch it either, I just want to make a preface to it. Okay. Perhaps the intensive dynamics and the to and fro of rich spiritual life... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Several spiritual masters, Sufis, most notably Ibn Arabi and his ramified school, did develop very complex theologies of names. However, and this is most unfortunate, these theologies were not reflected back into the systematic manuals of theology, and because of an aura of the mysteriously esoteric, have not had a straightforward influence on popular Islamic preaching. So, for example, in Ibn Arabi, you find the typology of Rahma, Rahma Sabiqa, Rahma Lahiqa, Rahma Tanma, Rahma Amma, and it's very interesting. But somehow, it's just never put in, in, a, in a theological, systematic theological form. For several years now, I have been trying to explore fresh ways of articulating an Islamic theology that calls upon and invokes an essential divine name that has often been neglected in classical systematic theologies of the Ash'ari and Maturidi schools. My focus has been, and will be here, the divine name Ar-Rahman. The divine name Ar-Rahman is related to Rahman. This word is very important and is worthy of some attention. Rahman is derived, derived from the root Rahman, or Rahman, this root gives rise to a host of words, semantic fields, including the word for the motherly womb, the word for one's kinship or loved ones, and the words that suggest semantic fields of tenderness, kindness, gentleness, mercifulness, and benevolence. All of this is within the scope of, of the, the root uh, Rahima. Now Allah has many names. They are all beautiful and they can all be used to call upon him. The tradition hands, as I said, the 99 beautiful names, Rahma or, com or compassion, is involved in two very important names of Allah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. As you may have noticed, both of these uh, two names come from the same root, Rahima, that we just mentioned. Ar-Rahman is a name that is exclusively used for Allah himself and cannot be used as the name of a human being. A human being can be called Abd rahman the servant of the Ar-Rahman, but not Ar-Rahman. This is because the name Ar-Rahman does not only mean the compassionate, but also the source of all compassion. It is significant that it is this name, Ar-Rahman, that is said to be fully interchangeable with the name Allah. Ud'u Allah, or Ud'u rahman It's never said of any other name. There is no Ud'u Allah or Ud'u Qaha, you know? Of course, ayyam ma tad'u falahu al-asma'u al-husna, you can always use the other asma'u al-husna, but the Rahman is picked out as totally equivalent to Allah. Okay? This is very important. And this is why I believe that there is strong support for the idea of basing it all on compassion. Okay? Ar-Rahim also means the compassion, and is a frequently used name of Allah. However, this name can be shared by human beings. A human being can and should be Rahim, i.e. compassionate. It is significant to note 
that while Allah reserves the status of being the source of compassion to Himself, He expects us to share with Him the quality of being compassionate. And this notion of sharing of quality of, a, of God is, a, of course, a very uh, important and yet mysterious and, and, and difficult notion. There is a very beautiful uh, elaboration on it in the Maqsad al-Asnab al-Ghazali, in which he says, you know, because Lillahi al al-A'la, God cannot be compared to human uh, characteristics, there is a problem of attributes and, and, the, and the use of human language. This is very similar to the discussions nowadays in, in the philosophy of religion when they talk about God talk, you know, and, and its, its status, ontological and epistemic and, and, uh, and even ethical status. However, Imam Ghazali and the Ibn Abdul both stress, and, and they're not the only ones in the tradition who say that man must, or the human being must, try to emulate the characteristics of Allah بحسب المستطاع according to what is possible for them and they point out that certain attributes of God cannot be uh, emulated they cannot be imitated however certain other aspects and attributes are definitely imitable not in the sense of being of tashbih or being anthropomorphically uh, analogous but in the sense of being indications a kind of uh, asymptotes that we can approach but never reach. And, and, and this notion of, a, of an asymptotic endeavoring towards is extremely important. It is very important for Ibn Arabi, for Ghazali, for Ibn Abi Salam, and also in your own tradition, and, uh, those Christians amongst you and the works of uh, such people as Nicholas, Nicholas uh, Cosanus. It is significant to know that while Allah reserves the status of being the source of compassion to Himself, He expects us to share with Him the quality of being compassionate. He, he demands it of us. Of course, as human beings, we can never be compassionate the way He is compassionate, but we can still be humanly compassionate. It is also very significant that one of the names of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is Ar-Rahim. Rauf and Rahim. It is Allah Himself who gave him that name when he said of Muhammad in the Quran that he is kind, ra'uf, and compassionate, rahim. What is interesting about Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and all of the other Prophets والسلام, including Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Zakaria, and Isa is that they are all both compassionate beings and living compassions of Allah. Each Prophet is a compassion because he is sent to his community by Allah, who as the compassionate source of all compassion, wishes to save humanity and to show them the way back to their maker. The Quran considers each prophet a compassion, or rahmah, of his. And each heavenly book sent with each prophet in order to guide people is also a compassion. Allah calls the Quran, in the Quran itself, a guidance, khuda, and a compassion, rahmah. So Allah is the compassionate, the source of all compassion, the prophets are compassions and compassionate, and divine books are compassions. Allah's giving of his many compassions as prophets and as heavenly books stems from his very essence as a Rahman, and is the fulfillment of a commitment which he primordially made to himself to be compassionate. As he says in the Quran, your Lord committed himself to compassion. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ this notion of divine self-commitment is extremely important and it is a firm ground, it's a firm ontological ground. This was one of the points of contention between me and uh, uh, Professor uh, Martinetti in the recent debate we had on the uh, pages of Chiesa and I'm really honored to have the editor of, uh, of the page, uh, Dr. Magister, with us as well. So, um, this self-commitment is extremely important because God Himself commits Himself to compassion. Okay? And that is the ground. Okay? For me, that is more ontologically fundamental than ontology. As a matter of fact, I agree with Ibn Arabi when he says wujud is only a manifestation of Rahman. So for me, being to one of Aristotle is not the fun most fundamental. Being is only a manifestation of divine compassion. For me, compassion is more fundamental than being itself. As a matter of fact, 
the old Greek puzzle about the connection between ontology and epistemology or the connection between being and knowing can only be bridged through a ground more fundamental than both being and knowing, a ground such as compassion. Even Aristotle, I think, to some extent, with the notion of, of love and longing, you know, that is inherent in being, seems to touch upon something like this. So God says in the Quran, your Lord committed himself to compassion. It is on the basis of this commitment that Allah demands that we ourselves, as far as is humanly possible, respond to his compassion. Our responding to Allah's compassion must be in the very living and exercise of compassion towards his creatures. In the Quran, Allah's compassion is said to be so broad as to be all-encompassing. He encompasses everything in compassion, it is said in the Quran. It is on the basis of the broadness of his compassion that Allah demands that we ourselves, as far as humanly possible, should embrace, uh, embrace as many of Allah's creatures as we can with our compassion. There is a hadith which is related by Tabarani in which a, uh, one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, he says, Shall I be compassionate to my friends? And he said, You know, what's the point of that? You must have a rahma al amma or rahmat al amma the all-encompassing compassion. This is extremely important because sometimes people like to keep compassion for just their group, you know? And there are lots of compassionate, what I would call inner group compassionate theologies. Okay. <laughs> it is very clear from the Quran and the Hadith of Allah's Prophet that dealing with others in compassion is a condition for our very salvation. The Prophet says, a man is not saved through his own work, but through the compassion for Rahmah of Allah. لَنْ يَنْجُوَنَّ مِنْكُمْ أَحَدٌ بِعَمَلِهِ قَالَ وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ وَلَا أَنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَرَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ Nobody will be saved by through their deeds. And they said, not even you. And they said, and he said not even I. Unless God encompasses me through or with, within his compassion. So that means what saves is compassion. He also clearly says, no compassion will be shown by Allah to one who is not compassionate. There is another hadith, Have compassion upon those who are upon earth, and the one in heaven will have compassion upon you. To enjoy Allah's compassion, we must treat others with compassion. A good number of hadiths of the Prophet, peace be upon him, make clear that Allah will regard any cruelty towards his creatures as cruelty against himself. And there is a famous hadith in, in Sahih Muslim, which is also the same in the, in the uh, Injil, where he says, Istasqaytuka ya abdi falam tasqini. I, I asked you for water, or my servant, and you did not give me water. Istafamtuka ya abdi falam tutaimni. I asked you, my servant, for food, and you did not give me food, and the servant is puzzled. How can I feed you when you are the Lord of, of all world, uh, the Lord of all world? And God replies, Alam ta'lam anna abdi fulana istat'amak falam tut'im? Alam ta'lam anna ka infa'alta? Uh, infa'alta? Alam ta'lam infa'alta? Wajadtani inda? Okay? Bimamana. Meaning, did you not know that my servant asked you for food and you gave him not the food? Did not, didn't you know that if you gave him the food, you would have found me there? This is extremely important. We're not talking about hulul and ittihad, okay, of, a, of an incarnation theology within Islam, okay? But uh, what we're talking about is a presence theology, okay? As the Asha'ira would say, عِنْدَهُ بِعِلْمِهِ yeah. Okay, so this is extremely important. So. A good number of hadith of the Prophet make clear that Allah would regard any cruelty towards his creatures as a cruelty against himself. Allah is said to regard the withholding water and food from a human being as the withholding of them from Allah himself. Allah is also said to consider the starvation of a single cat, this is the famous hadith, to be sufficient grounds for eternal damnation. So a certain lady was condemned because she starved a single cat. Okay. This is a hadith. And the saving of a single thirsty dog to be sufficient grounds for eternal salvation. And this is another hadith. In Bukhari, 
And interestingly, it is the salvation of a prostitute, which is granted because she gave water to a thirsty dog. Okay? And this is in the Sahih al-Bukhari. This is not uh, esoteric. Okay? This is like Sahih Bukhari. Right? And yet somehow, you know, we're not stressing it enough. Allah says that the murdering of a single human soul is equivalent to the slaughter of the whole of humanity. So when you hear of a car bomb killing 150 people, that's 150 humanities obliterated. Okay? When you hear of, of uh, a village bombarded with 20 people killed, that's 20 humanities killed over. This is, by the way, also a Talmudic principle in, in Jewish jurisprudence. Jewish and yet, the Jews do it to the Muslims. And it's an Islamic principle, and yet the Muslims do it to the, to the Jews. And it is a Christian principle, and yet the Christians do it to the Muslims, and, you know. So, we have to stop this nonsense. It really is nonsense. And it's a... And if we believe the Qur'an, and this is the word of God, then, you know, this is what he says. In an important hadith of the Prophet, it is said that when Allah created the world, he kept with him 99% of his compassion as a rahman the source of all compassion, and spread 1% of it in his creation. So you say, God is stingy, why he does he just give the 1%? It is said because he keeps the 99% because we're going to need it when we meet him. <laughs> and that is through shafa'a and Even the animals are said in that hadith to have a share of this peace, or, 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 or of this piece of Allah's compassion. We can't call it a piece because that would be tashbih, but it's a, a fragment, a spiritual fragment. Thus, even the compassion that keeps a horse from stepping or kicking its offspring, the hadith continues, is said to come from that 1% of Allah's total <coughs> compassion. As for the 99% of compassion, we are promised that it will be available for the faithful on the day of judgment. Okay? Now, interestingly, the very fact that the horse partakes in the very same compassion that the mother or the father partakes in for to the, towards the child means that there is a common substance of compassion, not substance in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the sense of material substance, but, the, but there is a, a unity of compassion even within the creation, even amongst the animals, between the animals and the human beings. Perhaps it is this rahmah that makes a relationship possible between a man and his horse or a lady and her dog Okay, or a little girl or cat. Maybe it is this rahmah that binds the two. In an important hadith of the Prophet, I, I mentioned that the hadith is significant, for it says that each one of us has a manifestation of Allah's very own essential compassion within us, and that each one of us has the opportunity and the duty to cultivate and actualize the divine, the, the divine compassion in his or her life and in his or her dealings with others. Thus, the cruelty that we sadly practice and witness every day consists in nothing short of the forsaking of the most precious trust Allah has put into our hearts when He created us, His very own compassion or Now we are all, now what are we to do with this compassion? Compassionate now what are we to do with this compassion that has been primordially and essentially gifted to us? Well, I can think of at least four things that we can that we must do. Can and must do. Number one, we must continuously remember Allah as compassion and remember His compassion towards us. Number two, we must live in gratitude or shukr for Allah's compassion. As a matter of fact, Islam itself is a is, is shukr. Imma shakira wa imma kafura, the Quran says. So the contrast between shukr and kufr. So when, when somebody is a kafir, what it really means is that they have hidden the compassion of God and they have covered it up. Okay? And they have refused to be grateful for this compassion and through gratitude is the practice of it, the practice of this compassion. The third thing we can do is ask God for more compassion through dua. And that is the meaning of prayer. Fourth thing we can do is ask for the forgiveness, for our forgetfulness and our cruelty towards ourselves, towards our children, wives, husbands, students, teachers. It's amazing how cruel humans can be, you know? 
And yet it's amazing how compassionate human can be, humans can be. We must live as intensely as possible in mutual compassion. This is what is called tarahum in Quran. And they also in the verse word tarasa bil marhama. It's called marhama. And grammatically this is ala wazan maf'ala, which is doing lots of it. It's a it's a sirat mubala, you know, it is a, an exaggerated form grammatically. <laughs> so we must do lots of this compassion. Now the list of things to do may very well sound sensible and fairly straightforward. However, it is an amazing challenge to keep up the daily discipline of not forgetting Allah as our, as our Rahman and not forgetting to live compassionately. This is why a proper daily practice of dhikr or remembrance is very much needed. This is also why the continuous meditation upon divine manifestations and signs of compassion must be cultivated. Through the continuous meditations of the compassion formula, we can remember Allah because in His compassion and kindness, He did not abandon us to our tendencies towards amnesia, but sought from the beginning and always to remind us of Himself. It is true that man is thrown in history, as some existentialists say. However, it is not true that man is abandoned in history, as these existentialists falsely claim. Because Allah loves humanity, and because he looks at it with the eye of compassion, the eye of rahmah. Allah reminds us, reminds us of himself all the time. Allah reminds, reminders take many forms, and these are worthy of some consideration. 